You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. I'm very pleased on this week's episode to welcome back my lovely wife, Hannah Brame. Hello, Hannah. Hi, thank you for having me. And we thought we would give you a bit of an update and talk about our adventure continuing because we are now in Girona in Spain. So this week's episode is going to be about traveling with kids and about what we're up to and what it's like living in Girona. But before we get into that, uh, it's been a a while since uh, everyone on my podcast has heard from you. So how are you doing? I'm great, thank you. Yes, I'm really enjoying life here. How are you finding life as a parent? I'm really enjoying it. It's really rewarding. It's a lot more fun than I thought it would be, um, a lot more enjoyable. I thought the beginning initial baby bit would be rewarding in its own way, but very hard as well. When you hear people talk about it, you usually hear about a lot of the really hard stuff. And there are definitely challenges, especially to do with things like sleep, which I haven't had enough of for a good 10 or 11 months now. <laughs> and just the amount of bandwidth it takes up, things like decision fatigue, And the surprising amount of energy it takes to really be present as much as I try to be. Um, And that's something that I'm still working on. But it takes up a lot more energy than I thought it would. It's been a huge learning curve, but ultimately it's been something that I'm really enjoying. I'm finding super rewarding and I'm really enjoying being a mom. That's awesome. And by the way, you can probably hear the sound of our daughter calling around the room in the background and expressing herself in lots of ways. So there's going to be quite a lot of background noise on this episode, but hopefully you'll still be able to hear the main conversation. So yeah, I was asking you about being a parent because I think one of the interesting things about us moving to Girona is the question of moving with a baby, especially because we actually moved countries, not just moved house. So traveling with a baby, I think is uh, something that a lot of people are interested in. What's your experience been so far? Traveling with a baby has been much easier than I thought it would be. Um, This is the second time we've been away with her now. We went away briefly in February for a week abroad, and that was a trial run for this move when we were still deciding, do we want to go abroad or do we want to go somewhere else in the UK? Uh, Do we want to stay put? Um, Because we knew we had to leave our flat at a certain point, but the question we were still deciding at that time was, do we want to stay in Brighton? Do we want to go elsewhere or do we want to go abroad and start our process of slow traveling again? And I was really pleasantly surprised how easy it is to travel with her I would add the caveat at this stage. Um, Obviously, she's semi-mobile now, but she's not mobile in the sense that she's walking around yet. She is not a toddler yet, and I think that is going to be a whole different ballgame when that's the case. Mm -hmm. But certainly while she is still a baby rather than an infant or a toddler, and she's pretty happy for the most part just being with us, I think, you know, with us, us paying attention to her and... She wasn't bothered by the things that I thought she would bother, be bothered by, like the noise of the plane taking off and landing. Those things totally didn't seem to phase her. She also really likes other people. <laughs> so she's had a great time while we've been traveling, making friends with other people, people sitting behind us, with people sitting in front of us, and generally um, charming a lot of people. Because <laughs> uh, she's a very, very smiley baby and she really loves interacting with new people. So yeah, all in all, the traveling with a baby part was much easier and enjoyable than I thought it would be. What was actually surprisingly hard was the amount of stuff that we had amassed while we were in Brighton the year and two months that we were there. I think partly because we had a baby and because also I was pregnant for part of that time. And so I had bought some maternity clothes and then I had bought a few things that ended up being a little bit hard to get rid of, like a maternity pillow and things like that. Things that I didn't just want to throw away because it felt a bit wasteful, but at the same time, they don't really have any resale value. You know, just little things like that end up adding up and making a big difference to how long it actually takes to move. Yeah, there's nothing like having to move out of your flat to make you realize the parts of your life that are no longer quite so minimalist. (laughs) And it was a bit of a task to get rid of stuff, but I think it was pretty easy compared to the first time we left the UK when we had to sell all the furniture and all of that. This time, there wasn't that much to get rid of. It was easier in some ways. I think what was hard for me is that a lot of the stuff that we were getting rid of now was really sentimental to me because it was stuff that reminded me of our daughter's birth and it was stuff that she had used or I had used 
when she was really young and that was really hard I and and to be to be clear a lot of stuff I gave to charity or I was able to pass on old baby clothes to friends and things like that and that that was a lot easier because I knew okay they're going to be used again and they're going to have another baby using them or another mother using them and that was nice to know but yeah I was quite surprised by how difficult it was to part with the things that were no longer useful to us things that she's grown out of or I no longer need but still had sentimental value that was hard that is a great point actually because those are the hardest things it's not the practical stuff it's the stuff that has real emotional meaning but we did it and we got back down to just having one suitcase each and flew from the UK to Spain to Barcelona and then uh, from Barcelona to Girona which is a small city close to the border with France and just an absolutely beautiful place. And I think one of the things that people will be interested in is, well, why have we chosen to come and live here? And what's what's the plan with Girona? So what do you think about that? I think we first heard about Girona through Jeremy and Winnie from Go Curry Cracker. We met them in person in Brighton last summer. And I think they mentioned that it was a place that they had liked. And so we added it to the list of potential places we could come when we made this trip. And the more we looked into it and looked into what was here and the size and the cost of living and things that are really important to us now, we have a baby, like safety and all that kind of stuff, the more it looked like a good option. And so then we started looking at, okay, well, what places were available through Airbnb? And um, we found some really nice places that were incredibly reasonable rent, especially compared to Brighton. (laughs) But um, it just looked from what we could see like a really good quality of life. And that's certainly been the case so far. Obviously, we're two and a half weeks in. We haven't been here for very long. But it is a really lovely city with a great pace of life. There's quite a lot here, but it's also fairly chilled out outside of the main touristy areas. And yeah, I think that about covers our thought process in coming here. Is there anything that you would add to that? Yeah, like you said, we were looking at a number of places to move to after our lease in Brighton came up, including just staying in the UK. Uh, But we did want to continue traveling. And one of the things that I think was good about Girona for us was that Spain isn't that far. It's a fairly easy first move to make. And since we came back from Panama, we've kind of decided to take things one step at a time and just see how things go with traveling. So we're going to stay here for the summer and just see how it goes and see how we feel. And this was an easy first step for us. In practical terms, getting to Spain is very straightforward. Practically, it's very easy. We know how to get things here and the shops are all very similar to the kind of things that we can get in the UK. So I think it was just an easy first move from that respect. And as you say, the fact that it's a very mellow town, everything's very walkable and laid back uh, was a, a real appeal to us. Yeah, definitely. The walkability factor was something that we didn't have in Panama and it does really make a difference. I think we've talked about this before on a previous podcast. It really, for us, given that we don't own a car, and we don't want to own a car. The walkability factor is really, really important to us. I think that's also a great point that you made about why why Spain was one of the places we were considering first off and the, the closeness to the UK and also the ease of travel. We were really not sure when we were thinking about this what it would be like doing this with Freya and what it would be like for her as well, which is was kind of the most important thing. And we wanted to give ourselves some leeway so that if there was any indication that it wasn't working out or she was not having a good time for whatever reason or it just wasn't turning out to be suitable, that it would be very easy for us to go back. Much easier than, say, if we had just gone straight back to Panama or, you know, somewhere or on the other side of the world where getting back to the UK, if we needed or wanted to do so, would not be so straightforward. Yeah. Funnily enough, another reason why we chose this place turned out to be not not actually very accurate. And that is that uh, we speak Spanish or we've been learning Spanish and we wanted to continue learning Spanish. And we weren't aware of just how important Catalan is because this is in Catalonia and Girona really is not primarily a Spanish speaking town. It's a Catalan speaking town, which has been kind of an interesting experience. What have you made of that so far? That was a surprise to me, <laughs> even though we did quite a lot of research into it. I, I, they, there's a lot more Catalan here than I expected. We have talked about, okay, well, what are we going to do this winter? And um, are we going to stay here? Are we going to move on? For me, that's actually one of the reasons to perhaps try somewhere else for a while, because I'm, I'm still learning Spanish. 
and I don't have the bandwidth to add another language into the mix at the moment, especially with a baby and I'm still running my business part time and I'm learning Spanish and, you know, I have other things going on as well. Life is pretty busy <laughs> and um, learning a whole other language at this point, even though in some ways it is quite similar to Spanish. And if you speak French, which I don't, um, there is there's some French words in there as well, but it, it is a different language. Uh, which is another thing that I didn't know before. I thought it was a dialect of Spanish. Mm. And I assumed that it would be understandable if you spoke Spanish um, or conversational Spanish like we do. Um, however, it is not. <laughs> so that was something that was a big surprise. It's definitely not a deal breaker, but it's something that I, I'm considering now thinking about, okay, well, how much time are we going to spend here? Yeah, we met a very nice friend here um, who, who's lived here for a while and he has taken the time to learn Catalan and, and I think it makes a huge difference in terms of him being able to meet people and connect and be part of the local community. And so we could totally do that, but it would be a major investment to take on another language on top of learning Spanish. So I think that's something that we're kind of mulling over in terms of what we want to do staying here absolutely i think if we decided we wanted to stay here for longer than this summer it would be worth doing and as it is you know i'm looking online and i'm learning basic phrases in catalan um just because it's nice to be able i think it is nice to be able to go somewhere and at least try to speak to people in the language that is their their mother tongue or the language that they use most often i, I to me that's just a question of respect i think the thing for me as well is that given that it's a language that we would only ever be able to use in this particular part of spain I look at the cost benefit analysis and I think you know that to learn it to a conversational level that's a lot of time investment for what could end up being just a few months that we spend here. Yeah. So I think I'm going to leave it to see how long we plan to spend here and whether we are going to stay here for the winter as well. And if that's the case, I think I might put a bit more time and energy into learning it, but if it's just going to be for the summer, I think I'm going to stick to my basic phrases and leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Another thing that was really interesting for us was the cost of living here and the quality of life that we can enjoy here for the amount that we have to spend. And you mentioned the comparison of cost between Brighton and here. I think people might be interested in the cost of living here. What are your impressions so far about uh, the cost? Without having solid data in front of me, because we haven't been here for a month yet and therefore we haven't gone through how much we've actually spent the first month here and how that measures up to what we were spending on what in Brighton, my overall impression is that it is cheaper. The rent is definitely cheaper and the cost of housing here. In general, I would say probably if you go into the old town, which is the main touristy part and also one of the most beautiful parts of the city, it's gonna be more expensive and perhaps even approaching UK prices. But in general, if you get outside of that area, the housing is astonishingly good value here. Yeah, we're just outside the medieval historical center in a really nice neighborhood. I would say it's a working class neighborhood, but a very well-established, good community. People are just getting on with life here. And we have a really nice flat with two bedrooms, dishwasher, washing machine, nice balcony. And what are we paying here? I think £1,200 a month. And that includes... That includes all of our bills. Yeah. Internet, um, heating, which obviously we're not using because it's warm. Um but heating, elect um, internet, electricity, water, everything, unlimited. And when you take into account all of those utilities and everything else, we worked out that already we're saving about 40% on our rent that we were paying in Brighton. But we've also noticed that groceries are really good value here. I mean, just great fruit and vegetables, way cheaper than in the UK. Yeah, I've noticed that some things are cheaper, some things are not. But I think overall, it works out in general as being cheaper. Um, the, one, the one thing I would say about the housing cost is, I think when we sat down and we looked at how much it was costing us here versus how much, not just in terms of rent, but in terms of rent and council tax and internet and uh, gas and electricity and water. And we also factored in estate agents fees as well and how much they worked out to the, the estate agent that we were using to rent our flat in the UK ended up charging us quite a lot of fees. And we, when we factored those into our monthly budget and how much that worked out being per month, it was really surprising seeing how much of a difference it makes being somewhere where perhaps the rent seems more expensive, the actual rental cost. But when you factor in all the bills and everything that are included in the Airbnb price, 
um, which for most Airbnb listings they are, it makes a really big difference having that just all included in one set price rather than having all your rent, but then all these little kind of extra utilities and bills that you've got to add on on top of that. Yeah, it's more predictable as well because you can tell exactly what your your housing cost, including all utilities, is going to be. And the other thing I've found is just that it's so much easier with Airbnb. I think Airbnb and similar services are going to change estate agents because our experience of estate agents in the UK has been really a, a bad experience. We've had a lot of hassle and it's been very bureaucratic and they have charged a lot of money. And in comparison, Airbnb is just, everything is very easy. You have that fantastic opportunity to see what other people think about places and get a kind of peer review thing going. And it's just made it made it really easy. I mean, my experience of moving into this place has been really positive. Definitely. And I, I think overall, you know, we've had one bad Airbnb experience ever. And I, I even hesitate to call that bad because we had a lot of issues with the property. It was not being managed properly. The owner lived abroad and he was totally happy to refund us our money and say, yep, that's fine. I totally accept everything you're saying. And, you know, you can move out whenever you want and you can have the rest of your money back. No questions asked. And he was very, very nice about it and very apologetic. And, um, you know, so I, I wouldn't even say that was, it was not a particularly pleasant experience living in that property, but in terms of how it was handled, so much better and easier than dealing with an estate agent. Um, I, I, I don't know if we've just been particularly unfortunate at this time, moving out of our property in Brighton. Overall, Airbnb has been way better for us. Yeah. A lot of people knock Airbnb for being not great or expensive, or you hear these horror stories about people completely trashing other people's places, um, which I think are very, very few and far between. But we we love it. I mean, we've had such a great experience using it, and I, I totally 100% recommend it. Yeah, and that bad experience you were talking about was back in Mexico in 2013. Yeah, and that is literally, you know, we've been staying in Airbnbs on and off since 2012, and that is literally the only bad Airbnb we've experienced out of a lot of Airbnbs, whereas we've had two rental properties since 2012, one in Mexico, one in Brighton, and both of them were pretty bad experiences. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that this experience of moving here has really emphasized to me is how important slow travel is for us to, to stay somewhere for at least two or three months rather than moving on day by day because it's a major effort moving with a baby and I know that some people do travel much more quickly and move on every few days or every week or two even with a baby um, but I, I just can't see that working for us. Absolutely I agree I did say that traveling with her was easier than I thought it would be and that's definitely been the case but it's still exhausting and you just have a lot more stuff when you travel with a baby as well. We have um, an extra suitcase for her. And even though it's just an extra suitcase, it's still an extra suitcase to pack. And it's still an extra suitcase to carry around and to unpack at the other end. And just a lot, there's, there's a lot more to think about than it is just with the two of us. And it's a lot more responsibility, frankly, as well. So yeah, I, I definitely feel the same way. Having done this move, I would not want to do fast travel with her. And I, I think perhaps some people would look at what we're doing and say, well, it's not really travel. You're more just moving to a different place every three to six months. And I think at this at this point, around four to six months is the ideal for us. But I think from my own personal preference point of view, I, I would not want to do fast travel with her. I would not want to move to a different place every couple of weeks or less frequently than that. Um, even every month, I think, would be too much. And I, I don't think it would be fair on her as well. Yeah, and I think part of it is just that there's, for me, there's a real joy in having moved somewhere new, actually getting to know the place and getting to feel like you live here and getting a, a kind of daily routine going and and being part of the community and the lifestyle to whatever extent uh, you want to be. And, and that's certainly already happening here. We have our little routines that we've got into and places that we go. And I, I enjoy that because it makes me feel like I'm not just passing through, but I'm actually experiencing life somewhere. Definitely. I found with the baby as well that life does slow down. In some ways it speeds up. You know, I can't believe that she's already nine and a half months. To me, that's crazy. But at the same time, on a, on a day by day level, it's quite a slow pace of life. And I've, I've enjoyed it. It was a bit of a learning curve embracing that, <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, but it's, it's been very enjoyable to embrace that. And I really appreciate how that fits in with our travel pace as well. And with her, basically, we can do one thing a day. There's one, one place we can go 
you know, one social engagement we can have. And that's pretty much our limit. If we try and do more than that, it gets a bit tiring. It's not particularly great for her and her naps and our little family routines. And so that also fits in with this concept of slow travel, where when we go to a new place, we can basically do one exploratory thing a day or meet one person a day and, and have stick to our one thing a day routine. Absolutely. So what would you say for people who might be interested in Girona as a place to visit or as to live as an expat, what would you say are the highlights? It's really beautiful. It's it's quite hard to overemphasize how beautiful it is. The architecture is gorgeous. There's a beautiful river. As we've already said, it's super walkable. You can pretty much get anywhere in the city within about half an hour. And if you don't want to walk, there are buses. We haven't actually used the bus yet, but um, they seem nice and clean. And The you, whole you, city seems super clean, actually. It does, yeah. I've noticed that too. The, the down, there's, there's the old town and then there's the commercial center. And even though the old town is medieval and old and you know a little bit crumbly in some parts, it's still super clean. And the commercial center is also very nice and modern and super clean. And the medieval center is basically a pedestrian... <laughs> Uh, windy streeted area with beautiful old buildings and narrow streets and little cafes and just looks beautiful and we had a gorgeous walk on the old city walls the other day which you can you can walk all the way along these medieval walls and see the whole town below it's beautiful yeah it's gorgeous um and al although this doesn't necessarily apply to us uh there's a lot of stuff around here for people who are more able to do outdoorsy things like you can ski in winter because it's really close to the Pyrenees um, I think there's really great hiking um, there's a lot of professional cyclists who live here because there's some really great cycle routes around here in this part of the country um, and every time I go out I see people in there kind of cycling lycras and you know yeah. really uh, serious looking cyclists doing their thing I think it has the perfect culture also for us with a little baby because you get really good value big lunches that you can have in nice cafes sitting outside in the shade and then we've been getting into the afternoon family siestas and just enjoying the lifestyle here it's a very relaxed mellow lifestyle did you have any negatives or downsides to Girona to mention so far? I wouldn't necessarily say this is a significant downside, but what I have found is that compared to larger cities like Barcelona, which is very nearby, there is less stuff going on for little kids and babies. And in places like Barcelona, where you have a bigger expat population, it's possible to find English speaking groups, etc. Right. I haven't found anything like that here. However, having said that, with if you get a fast train to Barcelona, it's 38 minutes. So it's totally possible to do a day trip or even a morning or afternoon trip if you wanted to do something like that. Um, I would say for the size of the city, there is quite a lot going on here, but because it is smaller, there's definite pluses to that. But I would also say if you're someone who enjoys going out and socializing with people through meetup groups or things like book clubs or hobbies, you know, things like that, um, it's probably going to be a little bit harder to find that kind of thing here compared to somewhere bigger like Barcelona. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other thing is I wouldn't really call this a downside, but it is worth bearing in mind that if you want to live here long term, then it is a significant uh, potential investment to, to learn Catalan. It's another language and it's a relatively small area of the world that, that speaks Catalan. But that's something just to bear in mind. Absolutely. And you, you, if you wanted to stay here longer time, you would need to learn it. All official stuff is in Catalan. Um, when you go out onto the street, a lot of the signage is in Catalan. Uh, a lot of people will speak to you in Catalan. So it really is, if you're here as a tourist, it's possible to get by on Spanish. But yeah, if you want to live here longer term, I would say it's, it's definitely worth doing. Well, I think our daughter's been very patient and we should probably wrap it up. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on our adventures in Girona so far. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.